less human. Let's have a look. Graves. More graves. I haven't touched anything, I swear. The trowel should reveal all. Archaeology waits for no one. Go, go, do it, do it. That's a bit of bone. What is it? <laughs> what is it? We just don't know. I'm Maya, I'm Head of Community at Dig Ventures. I look after all of you guys and try and help make sure that everyone on site is having a fabulous time. Come over and we're going to give you your dig bucket. You can grab a dig bucket. There you go. I love the huge mix of everything that we get to do at Dig Ventures. I mean, there's so much archaeology, but the best thing about it is the people. We welcome members of the public actually into the heart of our team and into the heart of the archaeology we do. They're not just around the periphery, you know, carting buckets around. They get to enjoy the best bits of archaeology that we do. It's just like opening up a discipline that people usually only get to see from the outside, but this is a chance for people to really see inside how that knowledge is produced and to be part of that process. One of the basic realities of doing archaeology is that it's really expensive. So when you're in a situation where you want to do some amazing research and there's this huge opportunity to involve people, crowdfunding becomes a slam dunk. So the way it works is you can crowdfund us at any level and starting at, you know, 10 quid, you get a copy of the site report, then you get a t-shirt, you know, graduates upward until finally you have the opportunity opportunity to put yourself in the trenches with our archaeologists and so the crowdfund is a mechanism where we actually fund the research but also make it possible for people to be involved. There's no middlemen, there's nobody saying like no you can't do this, it's just boom, it works. How are these then? These are weird, this one's not behaving. It's not what? It's not behaving. Is it the hole or is it John who's not behaving? Yeah. It's the hole, it's the hole. John's behaving beautifully. Yeah. I think it's a benefit having the community involved in digging the archaeology up. They do tend to be more careful, they're certainly more conscientious. I don't think we'd have noticed half the stuff that we found without the venturers' involvement. You get so many different people from different backgrounds having different perspectives on everything and yeah, you learn from them as much as they learn from you. Well, with the people that I'm working with, I'm really glad to have them is that they are so careful and so um, focused that they even find all the tiny ear bones in, within the skull. They keep all the little fragments so that's not just a case of quickly brush and then away with it but really um, taking care and being very careful with it. So this area over here this one's been a bit of a mystery, but got quite exciting at the end of last season. We started off with a, as with everywhere else, a kind of rubbly spread over here, which we took down a little by little. And there were some areas of burning and we started investigating it and ended up coming across more graves, which is a kind of ongoing theme. In, in the Western Trench, uh, we had burials starting to appear last year and we had more of those appearing this year and becoming increasingly clear. There's a lot of just basic cleaning back and the graves are starting to appear. One of the troubles is we just can't see the grave cuts. Normally we'd be looking for the difference between soil colour, which marked where the grave was, and we just cannot see it. Uh, you know, with a whole group of us, we're all we spent a lot of time on, on field work, field archaeology, we're all experienced and it's just the nature of the soil, which is a bit frustrating because it means you don't find the grave to be literally start seeing the skeleton coming out. On the eastern side it's it's just kind of graves all the way down. I've never seen a cemetery where there's so much intercutting and there's just graves everywhere. It's really hard to walk across the site because there's so much bone. The progress on Indusfine this year, it feels like it's been significant. We're really seeing the extent of the cemetery, which is really huge. Um, in the past years it's sort of 
really been confined to the east trench um, and now we're really seeing it extend further and further all the way across the west trench as well. Um, so it's it's quite a big area and understanding that is obviously important. Superb. Oh, that's brilliant. Oh wow, that's highly complex, isn't it? So there's another, another cutting here and this and then one just above. Yeah. Okay. We've had, I think, at least three bones from three individuals. Okay. Um, all mixed up with just this one brain. This is how just had just what some were found. Yeah, so this is come from the pelvis. Very, very tiny. I think human rib. Okay. So we, we might have a. Um, perinatal yeah. burial at the end. Yeah, so. Quite a sort of sombering moment, really. Yeah, absolutely. Goodness. Yeah. What's interesting, you had a number of kind of younger children. So you had a, a child, a youngish toddler. We had a tiny baby, a baby with, a, with his mother, a tiny, tiny baby, which is a bit, a bit sad. Um, and that, we, yeah, we seem to be getting quite a few children out, out of the area. Last year we removed an adult uh, burial from here and then there was an uh, infant buried next to that individual. But then when they went off to the osteoarchaeologist, she had a look at the bones and there was also another, even younger infant in that burial as well. And then this year when we've been m moving the burials, Around the shoulder of this individual, that we found about three ribs of an infant, um, but there's clearly non-adults in this graveyard as well. The thing that really fascinates me about human remains is just the amount of science that we can do that tells us so much about that person and then gives us a better idea of the site overall. We can see that the the population that we've got there is it's men, it's women, it's children, it's people of all different ages, different social statuses, different states of health and we wouldn't know that about the population here if it weren't for uncovering the human remains. A lot of what we've done over the past years has been dominated by uh, the cemetery and that's really interesting, we can get a huge amount of information out of that. But there are some other features, there's this socking great big wall. This big old wall that was right in the centre, right in the way. We'd all come down around that in the previous years. And we felt like it was time to get rid of it. Once you can get this wall out, um, I think it's worth having, having a little look, see what's yeah. underneath. Yeah. Um, because if we could find something from underneath, that will obviously date, mm -hmm. well, date the wall a bit. So we started by just half excavating the, the wall uh, lengthwise and we recorded what that uh, rubble core section looked like in the middle. And we could then tell that this, we had a, a spread of burning. So it did look like it was going to be a big circle, but every time we cleaned it, it almost just was like you had to be really careful because it was going to disappear and it seemed so thin. Yes. But actually, now it's, we have kind of cleaned that off. Yeah. It's actually, there seems to be these two smaller, like the same size as like a post hole type size. Okay. Um, and then when you section them, they've actually got the depth, which is nice. And um, how close was it? Because the, some of the wall is gone now. So was it yeah, abutting so the wall or was it to, to it one side? It looked like it was butting up against the wall. So the wall okay. was like, so this is where the stones have come out, where it goes down. Okay. They were kind of set in a bit. Originally I thought it was something very late, post-medieval, in the kind of process of taking it apart. It became clear that charcoal was clearly later than the wall. So it's, it's starting to kind of move earlier and that's, that's quite exciting. I've still got no idea what it is, but at least we started to get a chronology. So how are we going to get this out? <laughs> well, what if we... One of us done like that and then we have to swing it around. Oh, and pivot it on yeah, the... Yeah, kind of like a seesaw. Oh, yeah. Uh, but then what? Sounds fun. How does that... And then, and then walk it. Yes. Okay. Okay, so... <laughs> um, I think okay. they're best just rolling it slowly, but... We'll let them do their thing. I don't know if I'm ignored. I think... They're thinking really hard about the solution to the point in which they can't hear anything around them. I feel like I'm always getting filmed doing something stupid. 
Yeah, why don't Lip you just... Lift. Because you can lever it up with the mattock, instead of just, just roll, roll it, it like... then lever it back up and then roll right. it and lever it back up. It's, there's no time pressure to get it out. What? We're not going to pluck? They were such big stones, yet it was such a poorly made wall, but they'd gone to the effort to have such big stones that wouldn't have been easy to put there. Um, I mean, even we, we had to break them up in order to move them and then roll them out the trench. You couldn't pick them up. You're right, lifting. Just watch your feet, Lynn. We were really hoping there was going to be a burial underneath because that would really be able to sandwich it because you can obviously date a burial, which alas there was not. The big reveal is that it just seems to be sat on top of the layer below. We're in that stage now, aren't we, where we're looking at it and going... <laughs> no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> so it's matticking again and when we get closer to the graves it's trolling. It's looking like... Uh, early 9th century from the coins we found, but we are starting to also see burials deeper down. We've got the tops of skulls appearing, which are going to be buried a bit deeper than the layer we're currently on, so they might be a bit earlier, but we're coming down onto earlier graves all the time, more and more popping up constantly. We've got a bit we just call the furrow, which is our shorthand for saying we don't really know what's going on there. And there, it was, the progress was important, boring. It was just a case of just taking it down layer by layer, spit by spit. Uh, and finally, yes, we are starting to see things and inevitably the things we're starting to see are yet more flipping graves. More bone, possibly a vertebrae or something. Yeah, we'll leave it in the ground. Just um, leave it like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. When we come past with another pass with the mattock, it'll be something we can investigate. Now burials are very difficult to excavate, there's also an ethical responsibility to only um, remove them if you, if you have to. We've excavated some 10 now, there are 11 that are, are further exposed. Really it's not going to add much more t to that picture um, by, by um, removing more of those burials. Yeah. Here comes Naticus. Hello, have you got any bags or are you taking all of my bags? I gave you your little bags back. But the big bags? Oh, I've got some big bags left, I think. I took the ones that were here. Oh, in that case that's all that's left. Yeah, I need loads more. Speak to your Hannah. <laughs> Do you want me to go and speak to your Hannah? I'll go. Have you got any more friends bags, the big ones? Those look like big ones, yes, yes. However, I would prefer if you would put the... So these are for bag. samples. Okay, samples, fine. I thought you were talking... No, no. So, how many do you think that will need? If I take, how many am I allowed to take? I have a reputation of being a bit strict, but that's just because I'm trying to protect the finds team as such, um, while still obviously giving everything to the field team. Do you need red labels? Red labels, yes, these are from that special area, so... <laughs> <laughs> these are from the circular feature, thank you. <laughs> the uh, line of stones keeps going. Yeah, well we've got all sorts of ideas going through our head about what this could be. Could be a corn dryer, um, just on the basis that in the Anglo-Saxon plastic context you do get big corn dryers. Well we've got four more yeah. spits, so we're going to get several more spits down aren't we? We're going to have to stop. Oh yeah, totally. My aim is to get to the bottom by yeah. Friday. That'd be great. I'm not getting corn dry vibes off it at the moment. I was, I was, I was yesterday, but I'm kind of. It doesn't feel corn dryery to me. Not yet. No, there's no signs of burning on it. But we've got this key bit here where we haven't got anything yet. And it doesn't like the walls diving a little bit. But I suppose the next couple of spits should reveal what's going on. Keep on digging. The trowel should reveal all.
as we started to clean around that big circular feature, there were some other interesting features that started to appear, in particular some metalworking areas. We've got one small pit which seems to be full of um, hammer scale and other metalworking debris. And we also quite excitingly found a row of post holes and a, a beam slot, um, which is kind of classic early medieval building wall. And it ties in quite nicely with the row of stones, the wall line that we found several years ago now. So we're starting to be able to build a bit of a picture of the building that was there and the kind of activity that would have been within it. Once this is up and out, we're going to get this to the bottom so we can see the base of, well hopefully the extent of the burning in the base of the feature. If there's any further structural remains in there, really want to make a bit of an effort to get into the end there where we've got the kind of flue or stoke hole. I know that our research questions are really focused on, on the early, early medieval buildings and on the, on the furnace and they're all really fascinating but I think we'll never get away from the fact that people are interested in people. First person I want you all to meet is Harriet. Hello. Hi Harriet. Can you Hi. show us um, what you and your team have been working on this morning? Yeah, so this morning we are excavating a skeleton. Uh, so this skeleton... We're really careful about what we put onto social media when it comes to human remains um, because we, un I mean, we understand that firstly not everyone will be prepared to be scrolling through their timeline and just be presented with the remains of a, a long dead person. So we tend to try and, and report on human remains when we've got a bit more of a complete picture and to do it a little bit more in depth. So I think that's really important. I think if you actually see how the progress, that it's not just a point where you dig something out of the ground and then explain what it is straight away. The excavation is just the first part of the story, not the whole story. And what, what worries me is, is there's a lot of talk about Stonehenge and places being places of our ancestors. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with identifying with, with ancestors, that's not a problem. But you've just got to be careful that when you start talking about it in general ways, it can get very exclusionary. And I think we lose the complexity when we try and tell really simple stories. And I think you know, with the media, understandably, they want a simple story. So for me, the, the human remains that we find are more than just, oh, that's interesting that they're in the ground. They can tell us so much um, if we, we dare to look. Um, so yeah, for me, it's, it's understanding why people are here more than just the fact that they are here. You know, just the evidence that people were there before. It's, it's you know, we spend most of our time thinking about the mystery of, of now and, the, you know, what might happen in the future. And, and I think the reason why people love archaeology so much, and I know the reason why I love it so much, is that the minute that I see anything like that, the structures and the evidence of what happened here before, I just feel totally connected, um, not only to then, but to now and, and what's going to happen in the future. I wrote a poem a couple of days ago. Uh, I do generally write poetry. Uh, my PhD is about art and creativity and archaeology together. Part of my research has been thinking about archaeological poetry, even if that's not really a thing. Uh, we've been excavating a cemetery with lots of human remains, so it's a bit of a reflection on what that feels like and, yeah, thinking through having that kind of interaction with somebody who's over a thousand years old. Have you found the history of yourself away from your children? Here with the painstaking scrape of soil away from bone, have you managed to cast yourself sideways across what it feels like to be human? Into the wind with the rattling seals and howl of the seabirds, have you felt the pressure of dirt against your every soft limb? made yourself sensitive to every smallest change, to the place where people have sighed into the ground, their feet turned in, and a dashed hope of life in the muddle at her waist. Have you wanted to capture everything? Every beam of sun and sandblasted squint in your careful account of how you met them? On your knees, each record a prayer, each drawing a spell, as the singing drifts from the church, bringing us apart and together again.